Hello my friend, I hope you listen to this at night. When the light is turned off in the house or apartment. And now I will tell one story. And you listen carefully. Part 2 of The Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Dunwich Horror 5. The following winter brought an event no less strange than Wilbur's first trip outside the Dunwich region. Correspondence with the Widener Library at Harvard, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the British Museum, the University of Buenos Aires, and the Library of Miskatonic University at Arkham had failed to get him the loan of a book he desperately wanted. So at length he set out in person, shabby, dirty, bearded and uncouth of dialect to consult the copy at Miskatonic, which was the nearest to him geographically. Almost eight feet tall, and carrying a cheap new valise from Osborne's general store, this dark and goatish gargoyle appeared one day in Arkham in quest of the dreaded volume kept under lock and key at the college library. The hideous necronomicon of the mad Arab Al Hazred in Olas Wormius Latin version, as printed in Spain in the seventeenth century. He had never seen a city before, but had no thought save to find his way to the university grounds, where, indeed, he passed heedlessly by the great white fanged watchdog that barked with unnatural fury and enmity and tugged frantically at its stout chain. Wilbur had with him the priceless but imperfect copy of Dr. D.'s English version, which his grandfather had bequeathed him, and upon receiving access to the Latin copy, he at once began to collate the two texts with the aim of discovering a certain passage which would have come on the 751st page of his own defective volume. This much he could not civilly refrain from telling the librarian— the same erudite Henry Armitage, A. M. Miskatonic, P. H. T. Princeton, Lit. D. Johns Hopkins, who had once called at the farm, and who now politely plied him with questions. He was looking, he had to admit, for a kind of formula or incantation containing the frightful name Yog sothoth and it puzzled him to find discrepancies, duplications, and ambiguities which made the matter of determination far from easy. As he copied the formula he finally chose, Dr. Armitage looked involuntarily over his shoulder at the open pages, the left hand one of which, in the Latin version, contained such monstrous threats to the peace and sanity of the world. Nor is it to be thought— ran the text as Armitage mentally translated it, that man is either the oldest or the last of earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. Not in the spaces we know, but between them. They walk serene and primal, undimensioned and to us unseen. Yog sothoth knows the gate. Yog sothoth is the gate. Yog sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yog sothoth He knows where the old ones broke through of old and where they shall break through again. He knows where they have trod earth's fields and where they still tread them and why no one can behold them as they tread. By their smell can men sometimes know them near, but of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten on mankind, and of those are there many sorts, differing in likeness from man's truest idolon to that shape without sight or substance which is they. They walk unseen and foul in lonely places, where the words have been spoken and the rites howled through at their seasons. The wind gibbers with their voices, and the earth mutters with their consciousness. They bend the forest and crush the city, 
yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. Kadath in the cold waste hath known them, and what man knows Kadath? The ice desert of the south and the sunken isles of ocean hold stones whereon their seal is engraven, but who hath seen the deep frozen city or the sealed tower long garlanded with seaweed and barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their cousin, yet can he spy them only dimly. Ea shub niggerath, as a foulness shall ye know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not, and their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. Yog sothoth is the key to the gate, whereby the spheres meet. Man rules now where they ruled once. They shall soon rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter summer. They wait, patient and potent, for here shall they reign again. Dr. Armitage, associating what he was reading with what he had heard of Dunwich and its brooding presences, and of Wilbur Waitley and his dim, hideous aura that stretched from a dubious birth to a cloud of probable matricide, felt a wave of fright as tangible as a draught of the tomb's cold clamminess. The bent, goatish giant before him seemed like the spawn of another planet or dimension, like something only partly of mankind, and linked to black gulfs of essence and entity that stretched like titan phantasms beyond all spheres of force and matter, space and time. Presently Wilbur raised his head and began speaking in that strange, resonant fashion which hinted at sound-producing organs unlike the run of mankind's. "'Mr. Armitage,' he said, "'I calculate I've got to take that book home.' These things in it I've got to try under certain conditions that I can't get here, and it'd be a mortal sin to let a red tape r I don't need to tell you I'll take good care of it. It want me that put this D copy in the shape it is. He stopped as he saw firm denial on the librarian's face, and his own goatish features grew crafty. Armitage, half ready to tell him he might make a copy of what parts he needed, thought suddenly of the possible consequences and checked himself. There was too much responsibility in giving such a being the key to such blasphemous outer spheres. Waitley saw how things stood, and tried to answer lightly. Rule hold me up. Let me take it along, sir, and I'll swore that won't nobody know the difference. Well, all right, if you feel that way about it. Maybe Harvard won't be so fussy as you be. And without saying more, he rose and strode out of the building, stooping at each doorway. Armitage heard the savage yelping of the great watchdog and studied Waitley's gorilla-like lope as he crossed the bit of campus visible from the window. He thought of the wild tales he had heard and recall the old Sunday stories in the advertiser. These things, and the lore he had picked up from Dunwich rustics and villagers during his one visit there. Unseen things not of earth, or at least not of tridimensional earth, rushed fetid and horrible through New England's glens, and brooded obscenely on the mountain tops. Of this he had long felt certain. Now he seemed to sense and with a shudder of disgust, but the room still reeked with an unholy and unidentifiable stench. "'As a foulness shall ye know them,' he quoted. Yes, the odor was the same as that which had sickened him at the Waitley farmhouse less than three years before. He thought of Wilbur, goatish and ominous, once again and laughed mockingly at the village rumors of his parentage. Inbreeding, Armitage muttered half aloud to himself, great God, what simpletons! Show them Arthur Mackin's great God Pan, and they'll think it a common Dunwich scandal. But 
What is the close presence of some terrible part of the intruding horror, and to glimpse a hellish advance in the black dominion of the ancient and once passive nightmare? He locked away the Necronomicon thing. What cursed, shapeless influence on or off this three-dimensional earth was Wilbur Waitley's father? Born on Candlemas, nine months after May Eve of 1912, when the talk about the queer earth noises reached clear to Arkham. What walked on the mountains that May night? What rudeness horror fastened itself on the world in half-human flesh and blood? During the ensuing weeks, Dr. Armitage set about to collect all possible data on Wilbur Waitley and the formless presences around Dunwich. He got in communication with Dr. Houghton of Aylesbury, who had attended old Waitley in amazement, which passed slowly through very degrees of alarm to a state of really acute spiritual fear. As the summer drew on, he felt dimly that something ought to be done about the lurking terrors of the upper Miskatonic Valley, and about the monstrous being known to the human world as Wilbur Waitley. 6. The Dunwich Horror itself came between Lammas and the Equinox in 1928, and Doctor's last illness, and found much to ponder over in the grandfather's last words as quoted by the physician. A visit to Dunwich Village failed to bring out much that was new, but a close survey of the Necronomicon in those parts which Wilbur had sought so avidly seemed to supply new and terrible clues to the nature, methods, and desires of the strange evil so vaguely threatening this planet. Talks with several students of archaic lore in Boston, and letters to many others elsewhere, gave him a growing amount. Armitage was among those who witnessed its monstrous prologue. He had heard, meanwhile, of Waitley's grotesque trip to Cambridge, and of his frantic efforts to borrow or copy from the Necronomicon at the Widener Library. Those efforts had been in vain, since Armitage had issued warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians having charge of the dreaded volume. Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he feared gaping in the moonlight. What had come had indeed completed its entrance, for the barking and the screaming, now fast fading into a mixed low growling and moaning, proceeded unmistakably from within. Some instinct warned Armitage that what was taking place was not a thing for unfortified eyes to see, feared the results of being away long. Early in August, the half-expected outcome developed, and in the small hours of the third, Dr. Armitage was awakened suddenly by the wild, fierce cries of the savage watchdog on the college campus. Deep and terrible, the snarling, half-mad growls and barks continued, always in mounting volume, but with hideously significant pauses. Then there rang out a scream from a wholly different throat such a scream as roused half the sleepers of Arkham and haunted their dreams ever afterward, such a scream as could come from no being born of earth or wholly of earth. Armitage hastened into some clothing and rushed across the street and lawn to the college buildings, saw that others were ahead of him, and heard the echoes of a burglar alarm still shrilling from the library. An open window showed black and so he brushed back the crowd with authority as he unlocked the vestibule door. Among the others, he saw Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, men to whom he had told some of his conjectures and misgivings, and these two he motioned to accompany him inside. The inward sounds, expectant whippoorwills outside. Bits of shoe leather and fragments of apparel were scattered about the room and just inside the window, an imp except for a watchful, droning whine from the dog, had by this time quite subsided. But Armitage now perceived with a sudden start 
that a loud chorus of whippoorwills among the shrubbery had commenced a damnably rhythmical piping, as if in unison with the last breath of a dying man. The building was full of a frightful stench which Dr. Armitage knew too well, and the three men rushed across the hall to the small genealogical reading room whence the low whining came. For a second nobody dared to turn on the light. Then Armitage summoned up his courage and snapped the switch. One of the three, it is not certain which, shrieked aloud at what sprawled before them among disordered tables and overturned chairs. Professor Rice declares that he wholly lost consciousness for an instant, though he did not stumble or fall. The thing that lay half-bent on its side, in a fetid pool of greenish-yellow ichor and tarry stickiness, was almost nine feet tall, and the dog had torn off all the clothing and some of the skin. It was not quite dead, but twitched silently and spasmodically, while its chest heaved in monstrous unison with the mad piping of the ex canvas sack lay where it had evidently been thrown. Near the central desk a revolver had fallen, a dented but undischarged meaning why it had not been fired. The thing itself, however, crowded out all other images at the time. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it, but one may properly say that it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life-forms of this planet and of the three known dimensions. It was partly human, beyond a doubt, with very man-like hands and head, and the goatish, chinless face had the stamp of the Whateleys upon it. But the torso and lower parts of the body were teratologically fabulous, so that only generous clothing could ever have enabled it to walk on earth unchallenged or uneradicated. Above the waist it was semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest, where the dog's rending paws still rested watchfully, had the leathery, reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald with yellow and black, and dimly suggested the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was the worst, for here all human resemblance left off and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen a score of long greenish-gray tentacles with red sucking mouths protruded limply. Their arrangement was odd, and seemed to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to Earth or the solar system. On each hunk or feeler, with purple annular markings, and with many evidences of being an undeveloped mouth or throat. The limbs, save for their black fur, roughly resembled the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians, and terminated in ridgy veined pads that were neither hooves nor claws. When the thing breathed, its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed color as if from some circulatory cause normal to the non-human side of its ancestry. In the tentacles this was observable as a deepening of the greenish tinge, whilst in the tail it was manifest as a yellowish appearance, which alternated with a sickly grayish white in the spaces between the purple rings. Of genuine blood there was none only the fetid, greenish-yellow ichor which trickled along the painted floor beyond the radius of the stickiness, and left a curious discoloration behind it. As the presence of the three men seemed to rouse the dying thing, it began to mumble without turning or raising its head. Dr. Armitage made no written record of its mouthings, but asserts confidently that nothing in English was uttered. At first, the syllables defied all correlation with any speech of earth. But toward the last there came some disjointed fragments, evidently taken from the Necronomicon, that monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. Those fragments, as Armitage recalls them, ran something like, 
until the hitched cart they trailed off into nothingness as the whippoorwill shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. Then came a halt in the gasping, and the dog raised his head in a long, lugubrious howl. A change came over the yellow, goatish face of the prostrate thing, and the great black eyes fell in appallingly. Outside the window the shrilling of the whippoorwills had suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the gathering crowd there came the sound of a panic-struck whirring and fluttering. Against the moon vast clouds of feathery watchers rose and raced from sight, frantic at that which they had sought for prey. All at once the dog started up abruptly, gave a frightened bark, and leapt nervously out the window by which it had entered. A cry rose from the crowd, and Dr. Armitage shouted to the men outside that no one must be admitted till the police or medical examiner came. He was thankful that the windows were just too high to permit of peering in, and drew the dark curtains carefully down over each one. By this time two policemen had arrived, and Dr. Morgan, meeting them in the vestibule, was urging them for their own sakes to postpone entrance to the stench-filled reading-room till the examiner came and the prostrate thing could be covered up. Meanwhile, frightful changes were taking place on the floor. One need not describe the kind and rate of shrinkage and disintegration that occurred before the eyes of Dr. Armitage and Professor Rice. But it is permissible to see whitish mass on the painted boards, and the monstrous odor had nearly disappeared. Apparently, Waitley had had no skull or bony skeleton, at least in any true or stable sense. He had taken somewhat after his unknown father. 7. Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dunwich horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials, abnormal details were duly kept from press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Waitley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills and because of the unwanted stench and the surging lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by Waitley's boarded-up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer, who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence, had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome boarded place, and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filed a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning airship are said to be still in progress amongst the innumerable Waitleys, decayed and undecayed of the upper Miskatonic Valley. An almost interminable manuscript in strange characters, written in a huge bowl that served as its owner's desk. After a week of debate it was sent to Miskatonic University, together with the deceased's collection of strange books, for study and possible translation. But even the best linguist soon saw that it was not likely to be unriddled with ease. No trace of the ancient gold with which Wilbur and Old Waitley always paid their debts has yet been discovered. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening, and dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers on the tenth noticed a peculiar stench in the air. About seven o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's, between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to Ten Acre Meadow with the cows. He was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside the no less frightened herd were pawing and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back in the panic they shared with him. Between gasps Luther tried to stammer out his tale to Mrs. Corey. "'Up thar in the rud beyond the glen, Miss Corey, 
There's something, Bendar. It smells like thunder, and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the rud, like that a house been moved along of it. And that ain't the worst, nother. There's prints in the road, Miss Corey, great round prints as big as barrelheads, all sunk down deep like a elephant had been along. Only there's a sun twice or three times as big as any they is, head of being pounded down into the road. And the smell was awful, like what it is around Wizard Waitley's old house. Here he faltered and seemed to shiver afresh with the fright that had sent him flying home. Mrs. Corey, unable to extract more information, began telephoning the neighbors. Thus starting on its rounds the overture of panic that heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer, housekeeper at Seth Bishop's, the nearest place to Waitley's, it became her turn to listen instead of transmit. For Sally's boy Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill toward Waitley's, and had dashed back in terror after one look at the place, and at the pasturage where Mr. Bishop's cows had been left out all night. "'Yes, Miss Corey,' came Sally's tremulous voice over the party wire. Chancy, he just come back a postin' and couldn't half talk for being scared. He says old Waitley's house is all blowed up, with the timber scattered round like they've been dynamite inside. Only the bottom floor ain't through, but is all covered with a kind of tar-like stuff that smells awful and drips down off in the ages onto the ground where the side timbers is blowed away. And these awful kinder marks in the yard, too, great round marks, bigger round than a hog's head, and all sticky with stuff like is on the blowed-up house. Chancy, he says, they leads off into the meadows, wore a light moon that ridge, looked for Seth's cows, frightened as he was, and found him in the upper pasture nigh the devil's hop yard in an awful shape. Half on em's clean gone, and nigh half of them what's left is sucked most dry of blood, with sores on em like they's been on Waitley's cattle ever since Lavinie's black brat was born. Seth, he's gone out now to look at em, though I'll vow he won't care to get very nigh Wizard Waitley's. Chancy didn't look careful to see where the big matted down swath led arter it left the pasturage, but he says he thinks it pinted towards the Glen Rudd to the village. I tell you, Miss Corey, they something abroad as hadn't ought to be abroad, and I for one think that Black Wilbur Waitley, as come to the bad end he deserved, is at the bottom of the breeding of it. He want all human hisself, I always says to everybody and I think he and old Whitley must have raised something in that there nailed-up house as ain't even so human as he was. They's always been unseen things around Dunwich, living things, as ain't human and ain't good for human folks. The ground was a-talkin' last night, and towards morning, Chancy, he heard the whippoorwill so loud in Cold Spring Glen he couldn't sleep none. Then, he thought he heard another faint-like sound over toward Wizard Waitley's, a kind of ripping or tearing of wood, like some big box or crate was being opened fur off. What with this and that, he didn't get to sleep at all till sun-up, and knows to get up a party and do something. I know something's awful's about, and feel my time is nigh, though only God knows just what it is. Did your Luther take account of war them big tracks led to? No? Well, Miss Corey, if they was on the Glen Rudd this side of the Glen, and ain't got to your house yet, I calculate they must go into the Glen itself. They would do that. I always says Cold Spring Glen ain't no healthy nor decent place. The whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they was creatures of God, and they's them as says you can hear strange things a-rushin and a-talkin in the air down thar if you stand in the right place, atween the rock falls and bear's den. 
By that noon, fully three-quarters of the men and boys of Dunwich were trooping over the roads and meadows between the new-made Waitley ruins and Cold Spring Glen, examining in horror the vast, monstrous prints, the maimed bishop cattle, the strange, noisome wreck of the farmhouse, and the bruised, matted vegetation of the fields and roadsides. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down into the great sinister ravine, for all the trees on the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice-hanging underbrush. It was as though a house, launched by an avalanche, had slid down through the tangled growths of the almost vertical slope. From below no sound came, but only a dist sooner would slare. Three dogs that were with the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Someone telephoned the news to the Aylesbury transcript, but the editor, accustomed to wild tales from Dunwich, did no more than concoct a humorous paragraph about it, an item soon afterward reproduced by the Associated Press. That night everyone went home and every house and barn was barricaded as stoutly as possible. Needless to say, no cattle were allowed to remain in open pasturage. About two in the morning a frightful stench and the savage barking of the dogs awakened the household at Elmer Fry's on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen, and all agreed that they could hear a sort of muffled swishing or lapping sound from somewhere outside. Mrs. Fry proposed telephoning the neighbors, and Elmer was about to agree when the noise of splintering wood burst in upon their deliberations. It came apparently from the barn, and was quickly followed by a hideous screaming and stamping amongst the cattle. The dog slavered and crouched close to the feet of the fear-numbed family. Fry lit a lantern through force of habit but knew it would be death to go out into that black farmyard. The children and the women folk whimpered, kept from screaming by some obscure, vestigial instinct of defense, which told them their lives depended on silence. At last the noise of the cattle subsided to a pitiful moaning, Cold Spring Glen. Then, amidst the dismal moans from the stable and the demoniac piping of late whippoorwills in the glen, Selina Fry tottered to the telephone and spread what knew she could of the second phase of the horror. The next day all the countryside was in a panic, and cowed, uncommunicative groups came and went where the fiendish thing had occurred. Two titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground, and one side of the old red barn had completely caved in. Of the cattle, only about a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that help be asked from Aylesbury or Arkham, but others maintained it would be of no use. Old Zebulon Waitley, of a branch that hovered about halfway between soundness and decadence, made darkly wild suggestions about rites that ought to be practiced on the hilltops. He came of a line where tradition ran strong and his memories of chantings in the great stone circles were not altogether connected with Wilbur and his grandfather. Darkness fell upon a stricken countryside too passive to organize for real defense. In a few cases closely related families would band together and watch in the gloom under one roof, but in general there was only a repetition of the barricading of the night before. As he up came, there were many who hoped that the new horror had gone as swiftly as it had come. There were even bold souls who proposed an offensive expedition down in the glen, though they did not venture to set an actual example to the still reluctant majority. When night came again, the barricading was repeated, though there was less huddling together of families. In the morning, both the Fry and the Seth Bishop households reported excitement among the dogs, 
and vague sounds and stenches from afar, while early explorers noted with horror a fresh set of the monstrous tracks in the road skirting Sentinel Hill. As before, the sides of the road showed a bruising indicative of the blasphemously stupendous bulk of the horror, whilst the conformation of the track seemed to argue a passage in two directions, as if the moving mountain had come from Cold Spring Glen and returned to it along the same path. At the base of the hill, a thirty-foot swath of crushed shrubbery and saplings led steeply upward, and the seekers gasped when they saw that even the most perpendicular places did not deflect the inexorable trail. Whatever the horror was, it could scale a sheer stony cliff of almost complete verticality, and as the investigators climbed around to the hill summit by safer routes, they saw that the trail ended— or rather, reversed there. It was here that the Waitleys used to build their hellish fires and chant their hellish rituals by the table-like stone on May Eve and had deposit of the same tarry stickiness observed on the floor of the ruined Waitley farmhouse when the horror escaped. Men looked at one another and muttered. Then they looked down the hill. Apparently, the horror had descended by a route much the same as that of its ascent. To speculate was futile. Reason, logic, and normal ID 